The Life of Moses Written by our Holy Father among the Saints, the Holy Hierarch, Gregory of Nyssa Part 3 of Book 2 Contemplation on the Life of Moses The Cloudy Pillar Let us return to the point where we digressed. When those who already look to virtue and follow the lawgiver in life have left the borders of the Egyptians' dominion behind, the assaults of temptations in some way pursue them and bring on distress and fears and threats of death. When frightened by these things, those newly established in the faith lose all hope for what is good. But if Moses or some leader of the people like him happens along, he will counsel them against fear and will strengthen their downcast minds with the hope of divine help. This help will not come unless the heart of the leader speaks with God. Many of those who occupy a position of leadership are concerned only with outward appearances. Of those hidden things which are observed only by God, they have hardly a thought. But in the case of Moses, it was not so. While he exhorted the Israelites to be of good courage, he did cry out, although outwardly making no sound to God, as God himself bears witness. The scripture teaches us, I think, that the voice which is melodious and ascends to God's hearing is not the cry made with the organs of speech, but the meditation sent up from a pure conscience. To the one who finds himself in these circumstances, the brother appears limited in the help he renders for the great struggles. I mean that brother who met Moses as he was going down to Egypt at the divine bidding, whom Scripture has understood as being in the rank of angels. Then occurred the manifestation of the divine nature which manifests itself in the way that one is capable of receiving. What we hear from the history to have happened, then we understand from contemplation of the word always to happen. Whenever someone flees Egypt, and after getting outside its borders, is terrified by the assaults of temptation, the guide produces unexpected salvation from on high. Whenever the enemy with his army surrounds the one being pursued, the guide is forced to make the sea passable for him. In this crossing, the cloud served as guide. Those before us interpreted the cloud well as the grace of the Holy Spirit, who guides toward the good those who are worthy. Whoever follows him passes through the water, since the guide makes a way through it for him. In this way, he is safely led to freedom, and the one who pursues him to bring him into bondage is destroyed in the water. Crossing the Red Sea No one who hears this should be ignorant of the mystery of the water. He who has gone down into it with the army of the enemy emerges alone, leaving the enemy's army drowning in the water. For who does not know that the Egyptian army, those horses, chariots and their drivers, archers, slingers, heavily armed soldiers, and the rest of the crowd in the enemy's line of battle, are the various passions of the soul by which man is enslaved. For the undisciplined intellectual drives and the sensual impulses to pleasure, sorrow and covetousness are indistinguishable from the aforementioned army. Reviling is a stone straight from the sling, and the spirited impulse is the quivering spear point. The passion for pleasures is to be seen in the horses who themselves, with irresistible drive, pull the chariot. In the chariot there are three drivers whom the history calls viziers. Since you were previously instructed in the mystery of the side posts and upper door post, you will perceive these three who are completely carried along by the chariot as the tripartite division of the soul, meaning the rational, the appetitive, and the spirited. So all such things rush into the water with the Israelite who leads the way in the baleful passage. Then, as the staff of faith leads on and the cloud provides light, the water gives life to those who find refuge in it but destroys their pursuers. Moreover, the history teaches us by this what kind of people they should be who come through the water, bringing nothing of the opposing army along as they emerge from the water. For if the enemy came up out of the water with them, they would continue in slavery even after the water, since they would have brought up with themselves the tyrant still alive, whom they did not drown in the deep. If anyone wishes to clarify the figure, this lays it bare. Those who pass through the mystical water in baptism must put to death in the water the whole phalanx of evil, such as covetousness, unbridled desire, rapacious thinking, the passion of conceit and arrogance, wild impulse, wrath, 
anger, malice, envy, and all such things. Since the passions naturally pursue our nature, we must put to death in the water both the base movements of the mind and the acts which issue from them. Expo suspect. Just as unleavened bread was eaten in the mystery of the pash, which is the name of the sacrificial victim whose blood prevents the death of the one using it, even so the law now commands us to eat unleavened bread at the pash. Unleavened would be unmixed with stale yeast. The law gives us to understand by this that no remnant of evil should mix with the subsequent life. Rather, we should make a totally new beginning in life after these things, breaking the continuity with evil by a radical change for the better. Thus also he means here that after we have drowned the whole Egyptian person, that is, every form of evil, in the saving baptism we emerge alone, dragging along nothing foreign in our subsequent life. This is what we hear through the history, which says that in the same water the enemy and the friend are distinguished by death and life, the enemy being destroyed and the friend given life. Many of those who receive the mystical baptism in ignorance of the commandments of the law mix the bad leaven of the old life with the new life. Even after crossing the water they bring along the Egyptian army, which still lives with them in their doings. Take, for instance, the one who became rich by robbery or injustice, or who acquired property through perjury, or lived with a woman in adultery, or undertook any of the other things against life which have been forbidden before the gift of baptism. Does he think that even after his washing he may continue to enjoy those evil things which have become attached to him and yet be freed from the bondage of sin, as though he cannot see that he is under the yoke of harsh masters? For uncontrolled passion is a fierce and raging master to the servile reasoning, tormenting it with pleasures as though they were scourges. Covetousness is another such master who provides no relief to the bondsman. But even if the one in bondage should slave in subservience to the commands of the master and acquire for him what he desires, the servant is always driven on to more. And all the other things which are performed by evil are so many tyrants and masters. If someone should still serve them, even if he should happen to have passed through the water, according to my thinking, he has not at all touched the mystical water whose function is to destroy evil tyrants. The first stations in the desert. Let us again proceed to the next point in the text. For the person who has crossed the sea and has seen this Egyptian dead in it, as we interpret it, no longer looks to Moses alone as the staff-bearer of virtue. But in keeping with the foregoing, he believes in God, even as the Scripture says, and is obedient to his servant Moses. We see this happening even now with those who truly cross the water, who dedicate themselves to God, and are obedient and submissive, as the Apostle says to those who serve the divine in the priesthood. After they had crossed the sea, a three days' march ensued, during which they made camp at a place where they found water so bitter that they could not at first drink it. But wood placed in the water made the drink agreeable to those who were thirsty. The history agrees with what now happens, for to the one who has left behind the Egyptian pleasures which he served before crossing the sea, life removed from these pleasures seems at first difficult and disagreeable. But if the wood be thrown into the water, that is, if one receives the mystery of the resurrection which had its beginning with the wood, you of course understand the cross when you hear wood, then the virtuous life, being sweetened by the hope of things to come, becomes sweeter and more pleasant than all the sweetness that tickles the senses with pleasure. The next resting place on the journey, replete with palm trees and springs, refreshed the travellers. There were twelve springs of pure and very sweet water and seventy large, high-crested date palms which had grown tall with the years. What do we discover in these things as we follow the history? That the mystery of the wood through which the water of virtue became pleasant to those athirst leads us to the twelve springs and the seventy date palms, that is, to the teaching of the gospel. The springs are the twelve apostles whom the Lord chose for this service, and through whom he caused his word to well up. One of the prophets foretold the welling up of grace from the apostles when he said, In the churches bless God the Lord, from the fountains of Israel. 
and the seventy date palms would be those apostles appointed in addition to the twelve disciples throughout the whole world. They were the same in number as the history says the palm trees were. But I think it is fitting to speed our journey through the text, yet making the contemplation of the rest of the camps easier for those who are more studious by offering a few remarks. The campsites where the person following the pillar of cloud is refreshed as he presses on would be the virtues. Passing over the intermediate resting places with a mere mention, I shall call to mind the miracle of the rock, whose resistant and hard nature became drink to those who were thirsty when its hardness dissolved into the softness of water. It is not difficult to harmonize the sequence of the history with spiritual contemplation. He who left the Egyptian behind dead in the water, was sweetened by the wood, was delighted in the apostolic springs, and was refreshed by the shade of the palm trees, is already capable of receiving God. For the rock, as the Apostle says, is Christ, who is moistureless and resistant to unbelievers. But if one should employ the rod of faith, he becomes drink to those who are thirsty, and flows into those who receive him. For he says, I and my Father shall come to him and make our home with him. The manner. There is another event which we must not rush over without contemplation. After the travellers in virtue had crossed the sea, after the water had been sweetened for them, after their refreshing rest by the springs and palms, and after their drinking from the rock, the supplies from Egypt ran completely out. And thus, when they had no more of the foreign food which they had laid by in Egypt, there flowed down from above food which was at the same time varied and uniform. In appearance, the food was uniform, but in quality it was varied, for it conformed itself to each person's desire. What then do we learn here? We learn by what purifications one should purify himself of Egypt and the foreign life, so that he empties the sack of his soul of all evil nourishment prepared by the Egyptians. In this way, he receives in himself with his pure soul the food which comes down from above, which was not produced for us by any sowing in cultivated soil. Coming down from above, the bread is found upon the earth already prepared, without the wheats having been sown or ripened. You no doubt perceive the true food in the figure of the history. The bread which came from heaven is not some incorporeal thing. For how could something incorporeal be nourishment to a body? Neither ploughing nor sowing produced the body of this bread, but the earth which remained unchanged was found full of this divine food, of which the hungry partake. This miracle teaches in anticipation the mystery of the virgin. This bread, then, that does not come from the earth is the word. He changes his power in diverse ways to suit those who eat. He knows not only to be bread, but also to become milk and meat and greens and whatever else might be appropriate to and desired by the one who receives him. So teaches Paul the divine apostle, who spreads such a table as this for us, making his message strong meat for the more mature and greens for the weaker and milk for little children. Whatever marvels the history enumerates in connection with that food are teachings for the virtuous life. For it says that everyone shared in the food equally, the strength of those who gathered made no difference. They had neither more nor less than they needed. This is, according to my view at least, advice generally applicable that those making their living from material things should not exceed the bounds of need, but should understand well that the one natural measure for all in eating is to eat as much as can be enjoyed in one day. Even if much more were prepared than is needed, it is not in the stomach's nature to exceed its proper measure, or to be stretched by the insatiate desire for what is prepared. But, as the history says, neither did the one who took much have an abundance, for he had nowhere to store the excess, nor did he who took little lack any, for his requirements were lessened according to the amount which was found. In this account, Scripture after a fashion cries out to the covetous that the insatiable greed of those always hoarding surplus is turned into worms. Everything beyond what they need encompassed by this covetous desire becomes on the next day, that is, in the future life, a worm to the person who hoards it. He who hears worm certainly perceives the undying worm which is made alive by covetousness. 
The fact that what is stored up continues to supply nourishment and experiences no corruption only on the Sabbath contains the following counsel. There is a time in the course of one's life when he must be grasping, at the time when what is gathered does not submit to corruption. Then, when we pass beyond the preparation of this life and come to the rest after death, it will become useful to us. The day before the Sabbath is named the preparation for the Sabbath. This day would be the present life in which we prepare for ourselves the things of the life to come. In that life, none of the things we engage in now are undertaken, neither agriculture, nor trade, nor military service, nor any of the other things pursued here. But living in complete rest from such works, we acquire the fruits of the seeds which we now sow in life, some incorruptible, if the seeds of life be good, and some deadly and destructive, if the cultivation of this life produce such in us. For he who sows in the field of the Spirit, Scripture says, will get from it a harvest of eternal life, but he who sows in the field of self-indulgence will get a harvest of corruption out of it. The preparation for the better is alone properly called preparation and is surely confirmed by the law, and what is stored up during it is incorruptible. That which is perceived as belonging to the opposite is neither preparation nor is so called, for no one would reasonably call privation of good preparation, but rather a lack of preparation. Therefore the history prescribes for men the preparation for the better, and leaves it to the intelligent to perceive the opposite by its omission, the war with Amalek. Just as in military conscription the commander of the army first supplies money and then gives the signal for battle, in the same way also the soldiers of virtue receive mystical money and move in battle against the enemy, being led into the conflict by Joshua, the successor of Moses. Do you observe the sequence in which Scripture proceeds? As long as man is quite weak from maltreatment by wicked tyranny, he does not ward off the enemy by himself, because he is not able. Someone else fights on behalf of the weak, battering the enemy with one blow after another. After he is set free from the bondage of his oppressors, is sweetened by the wood, is refreshed from his toil at the resting place among the palms, comes to know the mystery of the rock, and partakes of heavenly food, then he no longer wards off the enemy by another's hand. Now since he has already outgrown the stature of a child and has laid hold of the vigour of youth, he fights with his opponents by himself, using as a general no longer Moses the servant of God, but God himself, whose servant Moses became. For the law which from the beginning was given in type and shadow of things to come remains unfit for battle in the real conflicts. But the fulfiller of the law and successor of Moses serves as general. He was announced beforehand by the name which he shared with that earlier general. If the people saw the hands of their lawgiver lifted up, they prevailed over the enemy in battle, but if they saw them hanging limp, they fell back. Moses holding his hands aloft signifies the contemplation of the law with lofty insights. His letting them hang to earth signifies the mean and lowly literal exposition and observance of the law. The priest lifted the weary hands of Moses, using as a helper a member of his family. Nor is this outside the sequence of things contemplated. For the true priesthood, through the word of God joined with it, lifts high again the powers of the law which fell to earth because of the heaviness of the Jewish understanding. The priesthood supports the falling law at its base with a stone so that the law, presenting a figure of outstretched hands, shows forth its own purpose to those who behold it. For truly, to those who are able to see, the mystery of the cross is especially contemplated in the law. Wherefore the Gospel says somewhere that not one dot, not one little stroke, shall disappear from the law, signifying in these words the vertical and horizontal lines by which the form of the cross is drawn. That which was seen in Moses, who is perceived in the law's place, is appointed as the cause and monument of victory to those who look at it. The mountain of divine knowledge, again the scripture leads our understanding upward to the higher levels of virtue. For the man who received strength from the food and showed his power in fighting with his enemies and was the victor over his opponents is then led to the ineffable knowledge of God.
Scripture teaches us by these things the nature and the number of things one must accomplish in life before he would at some time dare to approach in his understanding the mountain of the knowledge of God, to hear the sound of the trumpets, to enter into the darkness where God is, to inscribe the tablets with divine characters, and if these should be broken through some offence, again to present the hand-cut tables to God, and to carve with the divine finger the letters which were damaged on the first tables. It would be better next, in keeping with the order of the history, to harmonise what is perceived with the spiritual sense. Whoever looks to Moses and the cloud, both of whom are guides to those who progress in virtue. Moses in this place would be the legal precepts, and the cloud which leads the proper understanding of the law. Who has been purified by crossing the water? Who has put the foreigner to death and separated himself from the foreigner? Who has tasted the waters of Mara, that is, the life removed far from pleasures, which although appearing bitter and unpleasant at first, to those tasting, it offers a sweet sensation to those accepting the wood, who has then delighted in the beauties of the palm trees and springs, which were those who preached the gospel, who were filled with the living water which is the rock, who received the heavenly bread, who has played the man against the foreigners, and for whom the outstretched hands of the lawgiver became the cause of victory, foreshadowing the mystery of the cross, he it is who then advances to the contemplation of the transcendent nature. His way to such knowledge is purity, not only purity of a body sprinkled by some lustral vessels, but also of the clothes washed from every stain with water. This means that the one person who would approach the contemplation of being must be pure in all things, so as to be pure in soul and body, washed stainless of every spot in both parts, in order that he might appear pure to the one who sees what is hidden, and that visible respectability might correspond to the inward condition of the soul. For this reason, the garments are washed at divine command before he ascends the mountain, the garments representing for us in a figure the outward respectability of life. No one would say that a visible spot on the garments hinders the progress of those ascending to God. But I think that the outward pursuits of life are well named the garment. When this had been accomplished and the herd of irrational animals had been driven as far from the mountain as possible, Moses then approached the ascent to lofty perceptions. That none of the irrational animals was allowed to appear on the mountain signifies, in my opinion, that in the contemplation of the intelligibles we surpass the knowledge which originates with the senses. For it is characteristic of the nature of irrational animals that they are governed by the senses alone divorced from understanding. Their sight and hearing often lead them to what stimulates their appetites. Also, all other things through which sense perception becomes active assume an important place in irrational animals. The contemplation of God is not effected by sight and hearing, nor is it comprehended by any of the customary perceptions of the mind. For no eye has seen, and no ear has heard, nor does it belong to those things which usually enter into the heart of man. He who would approach the knowledge of things sublime must first purify his manner of life from all sensual and irrational emotion. He must wash from his understanding every opinion derived from some preconception, and withdraw himself from his customary intercourse with his own companion, that is, with his sense perceptions, which are, as it were, wedded to our nature as its companion. When he is so purified, then he assaults the mountain. The knowledge of God is a mountain steep indeed and difficult to climb. The majority of people scarcely reach its base. If one were a Moses, he would ascend higher and hear the sound of trumpets, which, as the text of the history says, becomes louder as one advances. For the preaching of the divine nature is truly a trumpet blast which strikes the hearing, being already loud at the beginning, but becoming yet louder at the end. The law and the prophets trumpeted the divine mystery of the Incarnation, but the first sounds were too weak to strike the disobedient ear. Therefore, the Jews' deaf ears did not receive the sound of the trumpets. As the trumpets came closer, according to the text, they became louder. The last sounds, which came through the preaching of the Gospels, struck their ears, since the Spirit through his instruments sounds a noise more loudly ringing, 
and makes a sound more vibrant in each succeeding spokesman. The instruments which ring out the spirit's sound would be the prophets and apostles whose voice, as the Psalter says, goes out through all the earth, and their message to the ends of the world. The multitude was not capable of hearing the voice from above, but relied on Moses to learn by himself the secrets and to teach the people whatever doctrine he might learn through instruction from above. This is also true of the arrangement in the church. Not all thrust themselves toward the apprehension of the mysteries, but choosing from among themselves someone who is able to hear things divine, they give ear gratefully to him, considering trustworthy whatever they might hear from someone initiated into the divine mysteries. It is said, not all are apostles, nor all prophets, but this is not now heeded in many of the churches. For many, still in need of being purified from the way they have lived, unwashed and full of spots in their life's garment, and protecting themselves only with their irrational senses, make an assault on the divine mountain. So it happens that they are stoned by their own reasonings, for heretical opinions are in effect stones which crush the inventor of evil doctrines. The darkness. What does it mean that Moses entered the darkness and then saw God in it? What is now recounted seems somehow to be contradictory to the first theophany. For then the divine was beheld in light, but now he is seen in darkness. Let us not think that this is at variance with the sequence of things we have contemplated spiritually. Scripture teaches by this that religious knowledge comes at first to those who receive it as light. Therefore, what is perceived to be contrary to religion is darkness, and the escape from darkness comes about when one participates in light. But as the mind progresses and, through an ever greater and more perfect diligence, comes to apprehend reality as it approaches more nearly to contemplation, it sees more clearly what of the divine nature is uncontemplated. For leaving behind everything that is observed, not only what sense comprehends, but also what the intelligence thinks it sees, it keeps on penetrating deeper until by the intelligence's yearning for understanding it gains access to the invisible and the incomprehensible, and there it sees God. This is the true knowledge of what is sought. This is the seeing that consists in not seeing, because that which is sought transcends all knowledge, being separated on all sides by incomprehensibility as by a kind of darkness. Wherefore John the Sublime, who penetrated into the luminous darkness, says, No one has ever seen God, thus asserting that knowledge of the divine essence is unattainable not only by men, but also by every intelligent creature. When, therefore, Moses grew in knowledge, he declared that he had seen God in the darkness, that is, that he had then come to know that what is divine is beyond all knowledge and comprehension. For the text says, Moses approached the dark cloud where God was. What God? He who made darkness his hiding place, as David says, who also was initiated into the mysteries in the same inner sanctuary. When Moses arrived there, he was taught by word what he had formerly learned from darkness, so that, I think, the doctrine on this matter might be made firmer for us for being testified to by the divine voice. The divine word at the beginning forbids that the divine be likened to any of the things known by men, since every concept which comes from some comprehensible image by an approximate understanding and by guessing at the divine nature constitutes an idol of God and does not proclaim God. Religious virtue is divided into two parts, into that which pertains to the divine and that which pertains to right conduct, for purity of life is a part of religion. Moses learns at first the things which must be known about God, namely that none of those things known by human comprehension is to be ascribed to him. Then he is taught the other side of virtue, learning by what pursuits the virtuous life is perfected. After this, he comes to the tabernacle not made with hands. Who will follow someone who makes his way through such places and elevates his mind to such heights? Who, as though he were passing from one peak to another, comes ever higher than he was through his ascent to the heights? First, he leaves behind the base of the mountain and is separated from all those too weak for the ascent. Then, as he rises higher in his ascent, he hears the sounds of the trumpets. 
Thereupon, he slips into the inner sanctuary of divine knowledge. And he does not remain there, but he passes on to the tabernacle, not made with hands. For truly this is the limit that someone reaches who is elevated through such a sense. For it seems to me that in another sense the heavenly trumpet becomes a teacher to the one ascending as he makes his way to what is not made with hands. For the wonderful harmony of the heavens proclaims the wisdom which shines forth in the creation and sets forth the great glory of God. Through the things which are seen, in keeping with the statement, the heavens declare the glory of God, it becomes the loud-sounding trumpet of clear and melodious teaching. As one of the prophets says, the heavens trumpeted from above, when he who has been purified and is sharp of hearing in his heart hears this sound, I am speaking of the knowledge of the divine power which comes from the contemplation of reality. He is led by it to the place where his intelligence lets him slip in where God is. This is called darkness by the scripture, which signifies, as I said, the unknown and unseen. When he arrives there, he sees that tabernacle not made with hands, which he shows to those below by means of a material likeness. The heavenly tabernacle. What then is that tabernacle not made with hands which was shown to Moses on the mountain and to which he was commanded to look as to an archetype so that he might reproduce in a handmade structure that marvel not made with hands? God says, See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. There were gold pillars, supported by silver bases and decorated with similar silver capitals. Then there were other pillars, whose capitals and bases were of bronze, but whose shafts were of silver. The core of all the pillars was wood that does not rot, but all around shone the brightness of these precious metals. Likewise, there was an ark made of wood that does not rot, overlaid with gleaming pure gold. In addition, there was a candlestick with a single base, divided at its top into seven branches, each supporting a lamp. The candlestick was made of solid gold and not of wood overlaid with gold. There was, moreover, an altar and the throne of mercy and the so-called cherubim whose wings overshadowed the ark. All these were gold, not merely presenting a superficial appearance of gold, but gold through and through. Furthermore, there were curtains artistically woven of diverse colours. These brilliant colours were woven together to make a beautiful fabric. The curtains divided the tabernacle into two parts, the one visible and accessible to certain of the priests, and the other secret and inaccessible. The name of the front part was the holy place, and that of the hidden part was the holy of holies. In addition, there were lavers and braziers and hangings around the outer court, and the curtains of hair and skins dyed red, and all the other things he describes in the text. What words could accurately describe it all? Of what things not made with hands are these an imitation? And what benefit does the material imitation of those things Moses saw there convey to those who look at it? It seems good to me to leave the precise meaning of these things to those who have by the Spirit the power to search the depths of God, to someone who may be able, as the Apostle says, in the Spirit, to speak about mysterious things. We shall leave what we say conjecturally and by supposition on the thought at hand to the judgment of our readers. Their critical intelligence must decide whether it should be rejected or accepted. Taking a hint from what has been said by Paul, who partially uncovered the mystery of these things, we say that Moses was earlier instructed by a type in the mystery of the tabernacle which encompasses the universe. This tabernacle would be Christ who is the power and the wisdom of God, who in his own nature was not made with hands, yet capable of being made when it became necessary for this tabernacle to be erected among us. Thus, the same tabernacle is in a way both unfashioned and fashioned, uncreated in pre-existence, but created in having received this material composition. What we say is of course not obscure to those who have accurately received the mystery of our faith. For there is one thing out of all others which both existed before the ages and came into being at the end of the ages. It did not need a temporal beginning. For how could what was before all times and ages be in need of a temporal origin? But for our sakes, who had lost our existence through our thoughtlessness, 
it consented to be born like us, so that it might bring that which had left reality back again to reality. This one is the only begotten God who encompasses everything in himself, but who also pitched his own tabernacle among us. But if we name such a God tabernacle, the person who loves Christ should not be disturbed at all on the grounds that the suggestion involved in the phrase diminishes the magnificence of the nature of God. For neither is any other name worthy of the nature thus signified, but all names have equally fallen short of accurate description, both those recognized as insignificant as well as those by which some great insight is indicated. But just as all the other names, in keeping with what is being specified, are each used piously to express the divine power, as for example, physician, shepherd, protector, bread, vine, way, door, a mansion, water, rock, spring, and whatever other designations are used of him, in the same way he is given the predicate tabernacle in accord with a signification fitting to God. For the power which encompasses the universe in which lives the fullness of divinity, the common protector of all who encompasses everything within himself, is rightly called tabernacle. The vision must correspond to the name tabernacle, so that each thing seen leads to the contemplation of a concept appropriate to God. Now the great apostle says that the curtain of the lower tabernacle is the flesh of Christ, I think, because it is composed of various colours, of the four elements. Doubtless he himself had a vision of the tabernacle when he entered the super-celestial sanctuary where the mysteries of paradise were revealed to him by the Spirit. It would be well then, by paying heed to the partial interpretation, to fit the total contemplation of the tabernacle to it. We can gain clarity about the figures pertaining to the tabernacle from the very words of the Apostle, for he says somewhere with reference to the only begotten, whom we have perceived in place of the tabernacle, that in him were created all things, everything visible and everything invisible, thrones, dominations, sovereignties, powers or forces. Then the pillars gleaming with silver and gold, the bearing poles and rings, and those cherubim who hide the ark with their wings, and all the other things which are contained in the description of the tabernacle's construction. All of these things, if one should turn his view to things above, are the heavenly powers which are contemplated in the tabernacle, and which support the universe in accord with the divine will. These are our true supports, sent to help those who will be the heirs of salvation. They are slipped through the souls of those being saved as through rings, and by themselves raised to the height of virtue those lying upon the earth. In saying that the cherubim cover the mysteries in the ark with their wings, the text confirms our contemplation of the tabernacle. For we have learned that this is the name of those powers which we see around the divine nature, which powers Isaiah and Ezekiel perceived. The ark of the covenant, covered by their wings, should not sound strange to your ears. For it is possible to read the same thing also in Isaiah, where the prophet speaks in a figure about the wings. The same thing is called the Ark of the Covenant in one place and in the other place the face. In the one, the Ark is covered by the wings, in the other, the face is. It is as though one thing is perceived in both, which suggests to me the incomprehensibility of contemplating the ineffable secrets. And if you should hear about lamps, which have many branches coming out of one candlestick, so that a full and brilliant light is cast all around, you would correctly conclude that they are the varied rays of the Spirit which shine brightly in this tabernacle. This is what Isaiah is speaking about when he divides the lights of the Spirit into seven. The throne of mercy, I think, needs no interpretation, since the Apostle laid bare what is hidden when he said, whom God has appointed to be a throne of mercy for our souls. When I hear of the altar of offering and the altar of incense, I understand the adoration of the heavenly beings which is perpetually offered in this tabernacle. For he says that not only the tongues of those on earth and in the underworld, but also of those in the heavens, render praise to the beginning of all things. This is the sacrifice pleasing to God, a verbal sacrifice, as the apostle says, the fragrance of prayer. Even if one sees skin dyed red and hair woven, the sequence of contemplation is not broken in this way. 
for the prophetic eye, attaining to a vision of divine things, will see the saving passion there predetermined. It is signified in both of the elements mentioned, the redness pointing to blood and the hair to death. Hair on the body has no feeling, hence it is rightly a symbol of death. The earthly tabernacle. Whenever the prophet looks to the tabernacle above, he sees the heavenly realities through these symbols. But if one should look at the tabernacle below, since in many places the church also is called Christ by Paul, it would be well to regard the names apostles, teachers and prophets as referring to those servants of the divine mystery whom Scripture also calls pillars of the church. For it is not only Peter and John and James who are pillars of the church, nor was only John the Baptist a burning light, but all those who themselves support the church and become lights through their own works are called pillars and lights. You are the light of the world, says the Lord to the apostles. And again the divine apostle bids others to be pillars, saying, Be steadfast and unmovable. And he made Timothy into an excellent pillar. When he made him, as he says in his own words, a pillar and ground of truth. In this tabernacle, both the sacrifice of praise and the incense of prayer are seen offered continually at morning and evening. The great David allows us to perceive these things when he directs the incense of his prayer in an odour of sweetness to God, performing his sacrifice through the lifting up of his hands. When hearing about the lavers, one will certainly perceive those who wash away the blemish of sins with mystical water. John was a laver, washing men in the Jordan with the baptism of repentance, as was Peter, who led three thousand at the same time to the water. Philip, too, was a laver of the servant of Candace, and all those who administer grace are lavers to those who share in the free gift. The interconnecting courts which surround the tabernacle are fittingly understood as the harmony, love, and peace of believers. David interprets it in this way when he says, Who has granted you peace on your frontiers? The skin dyed red and the coverings made of hair, which add to the decoration of the tabernacle, would be perceived respectively as the mortification of the sinful flesh, the figure of which is the skin dyed red, and the ascetic way of life. By these, the tabernacle of the church is especially beautified. By nature, these skins do not have in themselves a vital power, but they become bright red because of the red dye. This teaches that grace, which flourishes through the Spirit, is not found in men unless they first make themselves dead to sin. Whether or not Scripture signifies by the red dye, chaste modesty, I leave for whoever wishes to decide. The woven hair, which produced a fabric rough and hard to the touch, foreshadows the self-control which is rough and consumes the habitual passions. The life of virginity demonstrates in itself all such things, as it chastises the flesh of all those who live this way, if the interior, which is called the Holy of Holies, is not accessible to the multitude, let us not think that this is at variance with the sequence of what has been perceived. For the truth of reality is truly a holy thing, a holy of holies, and is incomprehensible and inaccessible to the multitude. Since it is set in the secret and ineffable areas of the tabernacle of mystery, the apprehension of the realities above comprehension should not be meddled with. One should rather believe that what is sought does exist, not that it lies visible to all, but that it remains in the secret and ineffable areas of the intelligence, the priestly vestments. Having been instructed in these and other such things through the vision of the tabernacle, the eye of Moses' soul, purified and elevated through sights such as these, rises again to the height of other insights when he is instructed in the vestments of the priesthood. Among these are the tunic, the ephod, the breastpiece shining with varied rays from precious stones, the turban for the head and the metal leaf upon it, the breeches, the pomegranates, the bells, then above all these, the rational and the doctrine, and the truth discerned in both, and the shoulder pieces tied together on both sides and fastened with the names of the patriarchs. The very names for the clothing keep most folk from an accurate contemplation of their details. What sort of material garments would be called rational, doctrine, or truth? Indeed, these names clearly illustrate 
that it is not the perceptible clothing which is traced by the history, but a certain adornment of the soul woven by virtuous pursuits. The dye of the tunic is blue. Some of those who before us have contemplated the passage say that the dye signifies the air. I, for my part, cannot accurately affirm whether such a colour as this has anything in common with the colour of the air. Nevertheless, I do not reject it. The perception does lead to the contemplation of virtue, because it requires that he who would be a priest to God also bring his own body to the altar and become a sacrifice, not by being put to death, but by being a living sacrifice and rational service. He should not inflict upon his soul a heavy and fleshy garment of life, but by the purity of his life he should make all the pursuits of life as thin as the thread of a spider web. Reweaving this bodily nature, we should be close to what rises upwards and is light and airy, in order that when we hear the last trumpet, we may be found weightless and light in responding to the voice of the one who calls us. Then we shall be borne on high through the air to be together with the Lord, not drawn down to earth by anything heavy. He who, in keeping with the counsel of the psalmist, has like a moth eaten away his soul, has put on that airy tunic which extends from his head to his feet, for the Lord does not want virtue to be cut short. The golden bells alternating with the pomegranates represent the brilliance of good works. They are the two pursuits through which virtue is acquired, namely faith toward the divine and conscience toward life. The great Paul adds these pomegranates and bells to Timothy's garment, saying that he should have faith and a good conscience. So let faith sound forth pure and loud in the preaching of the Holy Trinity, and let life imitate the nature of the pomegranate's fruit. Because it is covered with a hard and sour rind, its outside is inedible, but the inside is a pleasant sight with its many neatly ordered seeds, and it becomes even sweeter when it is tasted. The philosophical life, although outwardly austere and unpleasant, is yet full of good hopes when it ripens. For when our gardener opens the pomegranate of life at the proper time and manifests the hidden beauty, then those who partake of their own fruit will enjoy the sweetness. For somewhere the divine apostle says that any punishment is most painful at the time and far from pleasant. That is the first contact with the pomegranate. But later, in those on whom it has been used, it bears fruit in peace and goodness. This is the sweetness of the nourishment inside. The scripture commands that this tunic be tasseled. The tassels of the tunic are round pendants which serve no other purpose than decoration alone. We learn from this that virtue should not be measured only by what is required, and that we should discover something extra by our own endeavour, in order that some further adornment might be added to the garment. Thus it was with Paul who joined his own beautiful tassels to the commandments. For whereas the law commands that the ministers serving in the temple get their food from the temple and those who preach the gospel should get their living from the gospel, Paul offers the gospel without charge, being himself in hunger and thirst and naked. These are the beautiful tassels which adorn the tunic of the commandments by being added to it. Above the long tunic were worn two pieces of cloth which reached from the shoulders down the chest and down the back and were joined to one another by a clasp on each shoulder. The clasps were stones with the names of six patriarchs engraved on each. The cloths were woven of many colours, violet was woven with purple and scarlet was mixed with linen. Gold thread was interspersed through all this so that from the mixture of the various colours resulted a single radiant beauty. From this we learn that the upper part of the outer garment, which is in a particular way an adornment of the heart, is composed of many varied virtues. Now the violet is interwoven with purple, for kingliness is joined to purity of life. Scarlet is mixed with linen because the bright and pure quality of life in some way mingles with the redness of modesty. The gold which lends radiance to these colours foreshadows the treasure reserved for such a life. The patriarchs engraved on the shoulders make a great contribution to our adornment, for men's lives are adorned by the earlier examples of good men. Furthermore, there is another adornment worn on top of these beautiful cloths. 
Little shield-like ornaments of gold hung down from each of the shoulder pieces and held a four-cornered object of gold, further brightened by twelve stones arranged in rows. There were four rows, each containing three stones. No two of them were alike, but each was beautified by its own particular radiance. That was the outward appearance of the ornament, and this is its meaning. The shield-like ornaments hanging down from both shoulders symbolize the twofold nature of our armor against the adversary. Therefore, as I said a short time ago, since the life of virtue is lived in a twofold way, by faith and a good conscience in life, we are made safe with respect to both by the shield's protection. We remain unwounded by the enemy's darts by being armed with the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. That four-cornered ornament, which hung down from both of the shield-like ornaments, and which had on it stones inscribed with the patriarchal names of the tribes, protects the heart. Scripture instructs us in this figure that he who repels the evil archer with these two shields will adorn his own soul with all the virtues of the patriarchs, for each stone shines with its own brilliance on the cloth of virtue. Let the four-cornered shape be a demonstration to you of steadfastness in the good. Such a shape is hard to move, since it is supported equally by the corners at each side. The straps by which these adornments are tied to the arms seem to me to provide a teaching for the higher life, namely that practical philosophy should be joined to contemplative philosophy. So the heart becomes the symbol of contemplation and the arms of works. The head adorned with the diadem signifies the crown reserved for those who have lived well. It is beautified by an inscription of ineffable letters in gold leaf. Whoever has put on such adornment wears no sandals, so he will not be encumbered in his race and hindered by the covering of dead skins, which accords with the understanding obtained in our contemplation concerning the mount. How then is the sandal going to be an adornment for the foot? when it is cast off at the first initiation as being an impediment to the ascent.